want to talk. Yeah, no, that was a nice conversation, actually. So, <laughs> all right. So last last time we were we were together, we came up with this equation for the rate constant, right? This magical equation. Our k sub r is our rate constant. How fast the reaction occurs, right? This is typically proportional to per mole per second, right? How many moles get converted from reactants to products per second? Oh, there's usually some volume in here as well. I should probably, it's probably moles volume, right? So like that. So that's, you know, how, many, how much concentration gets transferred from reactants to products as a function of time. And, and it's a function of two terms. One is, again, this exponential term, our Boltzmann term, our statistics term, where Ea is the activation energy. Right there, the activation <coughs> energy is, bless you. We plot E versus reaction coordinate. Our products, our reactants, and products. Again, the difference between the reactants and the products is delta G star. Let me change this to delta G instead. And then the activation barrier energy is the energy between the reactants and the barrier. Right? Sometimes we call this delta G double dagger. If you ever see a double dagger like that, that means transition state, right? And this, this right here, the structure at this maximum is called a transition state, right? Not every reaction has a transition state, but most do. And of course, for our the example that we used last class was was the SN2 reaction of methyl bromide, CH3Br plus OH, to make CH3OH plus Br minus. And the transition state, again, for SN2, looks like this. You have the carbon in the middle of the H's. And you have the uh, bromine leaving and the uh, OH forming. Right? You, you, so if you're in the middle part, is the, the highest part of the energy is where you're like half methyl bromide, half methanol. OK, and, so, and, and then we have one more term, this A term. We call this the prefactor. Um, and this unit usually has units of per second per volume, which is basically the idea of um, A is already here. A is the number of reaction opportunities per second. All right, so it's basically your molecules come together. They come together at some rate A. And depending on how much energy they have when they say collide, the rate is the is the product of the two, right? So this is the number of collisions, and this is in some ways the efficiency of the collision. Right? The higher the activation energy is, the less, the more energy the system needs to react and get over the barrier, and the number of times it gets the chance to do that is A. Okay? And and what the problem with this is that we can we can do this experimentally. By taking the log of both sides, right, this is the Arrhenius equation, which says if you take the log of the rate constant, plot it versus 1 over t, you have a, a linear equation, y equals mx plus b. This is called the Arrhenius equation. Right, so if we can measure the rate of a reaction as a function of temperature, If we plot 1 over t, and again, this means if you go towards the origin, it gets hotter. And we plot it versus the rate that we measure, how fast we get react products from reactants, we'll get a straight line. I'm sorry, the log. Sorry, the log of the, of the rate. So let me get a nice pretty color. So as you cool, your rate will decrease. And with the Arrhenius equation, you should get a nice straight line. Right? And the slope of this line is the activation, the minus the activation energy divided by R, the gas constant, and the intercept is log of A. Right? So the interpretation of log of A is if the system has a temperature 1 over T equals 0, which means T is infinitely hard, large, right? infinite energy. 
then the fastest the system will react is logarithm of a, or sorry, is a. Right? That's the number of reaction opportunities, right? So the idea is if you have infinite energy to use, an infinite energy supply, then every time your system gets an opportunity to react, it will. And ultimately, it's going to go, and so that's the fastest it'll ever run, right, at infinity. Okay, so that's if you have a, a, a positive activation barrier. There are systems that don't, um, but let's just, most 90% of reactions have an activation barrier, most, most ones that you experience in real life. So this, these connects usually work for this case. But here's the problem. We, we have a sense of what the activation energy is, right? We, it's the energy difference between this transition state and the products or the reactants. We can measure it kinetically. Right? It's just an energetic argument. Right? So that makes a lot of sense that it has to do with, with a difference in energy like physically. But the, idea, the problem is, is what is A? How do we think of A physically? What's going on physically? Right? And so that's not very clear from this. So if you just, just had the Arrhenius equation like this was general chemistry, A is just an empirical number. It's got something to do with maybe the solvent, the temperature that you're at, the concentrations. It's just kind of a number. But is there a real physical definition of A? Um, and that's kind of what I want to talk about today. We can actually define what A is. And we'll do it in the dumbest way possible. What I want to connect today is that A is dependent on the number of collisions per second. Right? And that should make a lot of sense. The yes, SN2 reaction requires methyl bromide to hit to react with OH, right? So they have to touch. And then it kicks a bromine off. So there must be a collision occurring, right? They have to touch each other. Right, so we should think about collisions. Okay, so we'll do we'll think about collisions in the dumbest way possible. We'll assume ideal gas, but where the particles or the molecules are hard spheres. Okay, they're like billiard balls. They have a mass. and the diameter, right? So they're just balls. And, and they're hard, so that means that another molecule can't penetrate the other, OK? This is not a good color, I apologize. Right, so they're hard spheres. So they can touch. Ooh, this is, this is getting dangerous. I was going to say, they can touch but not penetrate. That's, that's really dangerous. But we'll, we'll write it down anyway, because it's true, all right? So they're just like billiard balls, OK? They wear chastity rings. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and so we could, and, 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 and all of their energy, and because they're ideal gases, all energy is kinetic. All right, we're just going to do kinetic energy. Right. So there's no attractions. Once we add attractions, the, the theory gets complicated. We can certainly do it, but let's just assume that everything's kinetic energy. Okay, so let's draw a figure. So here's my molecule A. It's got a center here, molecule A. And we want it to collide with B. Right? We don't know what size B is, but we'll say A and B are touching like this. And let's define a few, a few variables. First of all, let's assume that B is colliding with A, and that B has a velocity V like this. Let me erase this kinetic so I have a little more room. All right, it's going to hit A. We're going to define the distance between the centers as D. Okay, and then what we can define if we draw two lines, parallel lines from the centers, like so, we can define the distance between these centers as B. We call B the impact parameter. 
So if, if B is greater than D, B is, oh sorry, let me think about that for a second. Um, so if this is B then, and this is D, this is B, yeah. So if the system is, if, if the impact parameter is greater than the distance, right, if it's further away, then they're not colliding, right? So what we can say, what we can define then is a region, let me do it with a different color, around A, what's the color I haven't used yet, let's try this one. That is the length, a, a circle radius, a diameter D, or radius D, okay, like this. <coughs> like this. All right, and this is the region, as long as B is within this, this pink region, which I'll shade, we say that A and B are colliding. So we'll call this pink region the collision zone. We'll have a different name for it in just a second. Okay, so as long as, as, long as B is in this region, then they're, they're touching each other, as long as the center of B. All right, and so what's the... Now, the fact of the matter is, is that B can come from any angle. Right, so this is an area. This is a surface area, which is equal to pi D squared. Right, that's the size, that's the surface area of this collision zone. Okay, so we call this collision zone a special name. Well, pi d squared is called the uh, hard sphere cross section. Okay, when physicists use the word, of course, when you think cross section, you think, you think I'm going to cut something in half and look at it along an axis. Well, what, what we mean by cross section in physics is uh, literally the size of a target. Right? How big is the target of A with respect to B? Right? How big is how big is it? I, literally the, the size of the target, if you will. Uh, you see cross sections in physics all the time when people talk about particle colliders and things like that. They measure cross sections. Right? Cross section tells you again the more reactive something is, you can imagine, is the bigger its cross section. Right? Some things have really large cross sections. Some have really small ones. And Obviously, the larger they are, the more likely they are to be a target of a reaction. Right? So the cross-section tells you something about the reaction ability of a system. They're not necessarily just physical sides. Things can have cross-sections, for instance. A really great example is when you talk about how likely a molecule is to get excited by a photon. So like say an optical photon, a UV vis, a uni, a ultraviolet photon. Uh, if you shine an ultraviolet photon, at a molecule, the molecule has a cross section as a function of wavelength, as some wave as some wavelengths of photons or some wavelengths of light are more efficient, more efficiently absorbed. So we say the molecule has a bigger cross section for those wavelengths. So cross section can be a, 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 a function of many different things, but since we're just dealing with hard billiard balls, we just think of it as how big of the target A is. All right. So as long as B is in this region, they'll collide. We also need to consider the fact that A and B have to have enough energy to react. Right? They can collide with any energy they want, but nothing's going to happen if they can't get over the barrier. Okay? So typically we write the cross-section, physicists and chemists alike write the cross-section as sigma. Right? And of course it has units of meters squared. It's the cross-section. Every, every chemical process, any sort of scattering process, absorption process, has a cross-section. This one's just the basic old billiard ball cross-section. Okay, but we need to account for the fact that when molecules collide, they don't always react. Right? So we're going to come up with, the, again, the dumbest way possible to represent this, this cross-section. So we're going to define the cross-section as a function of energy. Right? And we're going to say it has two values. Zero, it's going to be zero if the collision energy is less than the activation energy. And it's pi d squared 
if the energy is at least the activation energy. Okay. We also have to consider the fact that these, move, these particles are moving kinetic, they have kinetic motion. And when you consider that, we have to modify this just slightly. We consider the fact, oh, let me write this like this. If we consider the fact that this is the case, yeah, let me write this for now. What you find is that if we plot E versus sigma of E, it's zero. If, it, if the energy is less than ZA, I'll just color it, it's zero. Right? There's no, there's no cross-section, the molecules can't react. And then EA turns on, and as the energy increases, the, ener the, the cross-section increases monotonically with energy until it levels off, until it reaches the asymptote pi d squared. Okay, so the idea is, is that that basically once the energy of the collision reaches the activation energy, the reaction turns on, but the efficiency of the reaction has to increase as the energy increases. The more energy you pump into the system, the more likely the system is going to get over the barrier. So, so pi d squared should be our asymptote, right, at infinite energy. That's the most efficient possible or the largest possible cross-section. And so we actually have to write it slightly differently. this for now. We don't need this anymore. So what we'll do instead is say sigma of E. And once you do this analysis, I'll skip the steps, but it's zero if E is less than EA. And then it's pi D squared times 1 minus EA over E. if E is greater than E equal to EA. And this gives you this nice behavior. So you don't want the reaction to just go immediately up to pi, the cross-section to go immediately up to pi D squared. You could do that, but you get the wrong result. It's like the reaction's not really an on-off switch, but it's kind of a, a slow logistic function that kind of slowly turns on as the energy increases. It's right. so a really, really simple way to approach this. OK, so. Now we have to think about how, now that we know the size of our collision, right, the size of the target, we have to think about the kinetics of these collisions. All right, so now kinetics. How many collisions per second? How many times do these cross sections, how many times do we have a reaction with this cross section size? How many collisions per second? So we have to define, we have to do some bookkeeping. Because this doesn't, all right, the cross section has nothing to do with time. It's just a size, right? It's just a just a surface area. So we have to we have to do a little bit of work. So let's think about some things to add time. How do we add time to the system? Well, one thing is, is that the energy of our system is one half mv squared. Well, ma plus mv. Right? It's the sum of the kinetic energies of both molecules. Right? And because it's a two-body system, we can reduce using the center of mass frame to a one-body system, where the energy is now one-half mu. Let me write mu properly. V squared, where V is the relative velocity of the system. And mu is the reduced mass, which is ma times mb over ma plus mb. Right. So it's bringing back some physics one information here. Right? But it's a one body, two body problem. We can reduce it to a one body problem by shifting to the center of mass. OK, so the nice thing is, is that any energy, we have some time in here, right? v squared, there's got to be a 1 over, right? Velocity is per time. So that's useful. That means then that the collision rate 
should be proportional to the velocity of the system. Right? And because it's an ideal gas, this is this black one is dead. The, because it's an ideal gas, the energy is RT, roughly, proportional. Let's just say roughly RT. One half mu v squared, which means that velocity is the square root of proportional. It's roughly proportional to, we'll just say proportional to, RT over mu, depending on the mass and the temperature of the system. The hotter it is, the faster things move. Okay? So that means that we have some time here, right? We have, so that's nice, we have meters per second. We've got some things with meters here, right? This is <coughs> meters squared, meters per second, right? So that, that, interestingly, that gives us meters cubed per second. That's volume. So we're kind of getting on the right track, right? We've got to think about volume right? because this is a three dimensional object. And so we've got some volume in there, but we've got a few other things to think about. <coughs> Right, this is the collision rate's proportional to velocity, but it's also proportional to how many molecules there are. Right, so one is, is that the collision rate is proportional to velocity. It's also proportional to the concentrations of A and B. Right, the more B and A there are in the mixture, right, the more there are per unit volume, the more collisions there are. For gases, We'll write concentration as number density, which instead of moles per liter, it's molecules per liter. So we'll, I'll call this N sub A and N sub B, where units are molecules per unit volume, per meters cubed. Okay. Concentrations aren't super helpful because you have to define a volume, so we're just going to say how many molecules there are per unit volume. All right, just kind of the simplest thing possible. Okay, And obviously, then it also depends on the cross-section. right? So it's the size of the target, it's how many targets there are, and it's how fast they hit each other, right? how fast they're moving. How fast do we sample, if you will? All right, so that must mean then that the rate, the collision rate, is equal to, let me make sure I got it right, the cross section times the velocity times the number densities of the two models. And then we also have this, we also have the, 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 the Boltzmann factor, the e to the minus ea over rt. Well, let's not add that yet. Let's just hold on to that for a second. Hold on. So let's check the units of this real quick, just to make sure that the units make sense. These are meters squared. This is meters per second. And these are both, uh, these are molecules per meters cubed squared. So we have meters cubed, this is equal to meters cubed per second times meters to the sixth. Molecules isn't a real unit, so I'll just get rid of it for now. And so this is one over per second <coughs> per volume. So those units make a lot of sense. Collision rate should be per second, and it should be per unit volume. Right? So collision rate is exactly that. So this makes sense. Right? All it is is how big the target is, how fast they're moving, and how many there are. All right, so that means then, in order to get a rate, we have to <coughs> consider the energy of the collision, how much energy these systems have on average, the collision has on average. So the rate constant should be sigma times the velocity times the number densities. Oh, that's a W, not an N. I can't draw an N anymore. There we go. And B times E to the minus EA over RT. Okay, 
So if we, if we compare this to our, the Arrhenius equation, we see that A is equal to the cross-section times the velocity times the number densities. Okay, And when we, we can do a little bit more math, And if we define a volume and define a concentration and use ideal gas law, so we apply ideal gas here to get the velocity of an ideal gas, A is equal to sigma. The velocity of an ideal gas at a given temperature is ART over pi times the reduced mass of the system. And then for concentrations, we can multiply by Avogadro's number twice and the concentrations of A and B. That, that's how we convert between number density and concentration, is just by multiplying by that again. <coughs> okay, so all A is, all A is, is just like we said, A is the rate of reaction opportunities, which is just the rate of collisions. how big the targets are, how fast they're moving, and how many we got. Okay, so that makes a lot of sense. If the system, again, as I said, if the system had, it was at infinite temperature, it had as much energy as it wanted, it can get over any barrier at once, then the fastest it can go is as fast as the molecules can collide with each other, right? Which is why the intercept of the Arrhenius equation is the log of A. It's the fastest it can go. Okay, and that's because it's ultimately attenuated by the number of collisions and how big the molecules are. All, right, all we've done is, so let's let's do an example. Let's see how good this approximation is. What we've done, all we've done is this is what physicists call the the spherical cow approach to things. Right? We just assume everything's a sphere, and they just bump around like idiots, um, and see if we get a good answer. Uh, where can I go? We'll go over here. I really like this figure. I'm going to try to keep it. I'm going to get rid of it. I got it. I need more space. <laughs> Damn. Damn. Is it a good circle? Yeah, it's a good circle. I'm really bad at circles, so it's a good one. I had a good one. All right, so let's do an example. So I want to start with a really simple reaction. I want to hydrogenate ethylene. So I'm going to take H2, and I'm going to react it with ethylene in the gas phase. And of course, when you do that, you hydrogenate the double bond and fully saturate, so you get methane out. All right, we're going to look at this reaction. All right, and we're going to try to calculate using hard spheres what the rate of this reaction is. Okay, so let's assume. First that every collision leads to, leads to a reaction. So that means that Kr is just equal to A. It's the activation energy is zero. It's perfectly efficient. Right? And we can calculate that if we know the size and the shape of our, our targets. Right? That's all we need to know. Because we know the temperature, we know the masses of them, obviously. Concentrations are irrelevant at this point. We can come up with a mole per liter if we want it. Um, and we can calculate, and so then all we have to do is calculate the cross section. Right? And so let's do the dumbest thing possible. Let's take H2 and turn it into a sphere. And let's take ethylene and make it a sphere, right? Where the where the where the, the diameter of the sphere has to do with the length of the molecule. Right? Really dumb approximation, but let's bear with me. The diameter of H2 will be 2.7 angstroms. And the diameter of ethylene, C2H4, is uh, something like 4, I think. 
Um, yeah, 4.3 angstroms. Okay, so we know the sizes of the two spheres, so we can calculate the, the, the uh, cross section. So the cross section is going to be pi times uh, one half the sum of the, of the cross sections. So that's 2.7 angstroms plus 4.3 angstroms divided by 2 squared. Right, that's the area, surface area of that cross section. And, and this is equal to, I'll just say roughly this is equal to, so I'll write sigma here. Sigma is equal to um, 3.85 times 10 to the minus 19 meters squared. And, and this is actually a really reasonable number. Most, most cross sections, collisional cross sections for small molecules are on the order of 10 to the minus 20, 10 to the minus 18, somewhere in that region. Right, molecules are on the order of one angstrom, right? Well, let's say 10 angstroms, a nanometer, it's 10 to the minus 9, so 10 to the minus 9 squared is 10 to the minus 18, right? So these numbers are pretty reasonable. Meanwhile, the cross section of, of a proton, with a, a large hadron collider, and they collide two protons, their cross sections are on the order of 10 to the minus 35. That's how sensitive this system is. The LHC is amazing. Right? Large energy, large hadron, or high energy physics, they study things at, at cross sections eight, 15 times the large, smaller magnitude than chemistry. Right? It's really, really quite amazing. Um, I digress. Um, and so now, so that means now that the, if KR is equal to A, and KR is equal to sigma times the average velocity, and we'll multiply by Avogadro's number to get per mole. And so this is 3.85 times 10 to the minus 19 meters squared. The average velocity is this RT term with the mass. All right, it's easy to calculate. The average velocity of this system is 1.83 times 10 to the 3 meters per second. And we multiply by Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd per mole. And then I want to convert it into, um, this is all in meters, I want to convert it into liters. So this is 1,000 liters per meters cubed. Right? That's the conversion. And so you get a rate, a collisional rate of 4.24 times 10 to the 11 liters per mole per second. That says on average that you get you get this many molecules or this much concentration, 10 to the 11 liters per mole per second of that thing. That's a pretty fast, pretty fast reaction. And that means it reacts on the order of a picosecond or so. All right, so then let's go into the lab and measure the same thing. This is, I'll just remind you, this is at T equals 298 Kelvin. 298 Kelvin. And at one bar, but I digress. Um, and so let's go into the uh, lab and measure the same thing at 298. And the number is 3.5 times 10 to the minus 26 liters per mole per second. So we're off by 37 orders of magnitude. Um, so that's no good. So obviously this assumption that, 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 the, that collisions are 100% efficient is total garbage, right? It's so bad that we're off by you know, almost as many atoms as there are in the universe. Um, I think it's about 10 or 40. So this is not even, it's, the, the Wolfgang Pauli says it's so bad it's not even wrong. That's how bad this is. So that must mean that the, the activation energy part, the, the thing that we didn't include, is very important. Right? That the activation energy ultimately determines the rate. So let's, but this is a prediction then, but that's okay. This is still a prediction for A. Right, we still think A experimentally should be around the order of 10 to the 11. Right, we just it, it's just attenuated by the exponent. So that would mean, therefore, KR exp. If we take the ratio of the rates, KR this theory one hard sphere we'll call it. This should be equal to the activation energy. Right, because that's the only thing different between the two. 
And so when you take 3.5 times 10 to the minus 26, that's the experimental number, divided by 4.24 times 10 to the 11 liters per mole per second, and equal that to the e to the minus ea over rt, and solve for ea, you get that ea is 211 kilojoules per mole. Right? So it's got a big activation energy, right? It's so big, right? This is attenuated so much that minus ea over rt is on the order of, excuse me, um, minus 85. Right? It's attenuated by a factor of e to the minus 85. That's a huge number. Right? So the activation energy plays a crucial role in, in kinetics. Right? Every, if, if there was no activation energy, if it didn't matter, if the system did not care, right? which is absurd, but just bear with me, that every collision is efficient, then every collision would be around 10 to the 11 liters per mole per second, right? Because all the molecules, their ideal gases, they all move the same way, and it's just a matter of their size, right? So they're all roughly the same size, so they're going to collide with this efficiency. So the activation energy is the only thing that keeps everything from reacting with itself. Right? The fact that you have to get over the barrier. And so but now the question is, is this a good prediction, right? Are we still making a decent assumption? And in fact, the activation energy from experiment is 180. So we're doing pretty good, right? We're off by about 20%. Right? So, so the, the theory that, that, that molecules can react like hard spheres, at least in this case, is a good one. I mean, 20% for just assuming everything's a spherical cow is, is not bad. Right? That's, I mean, we, you can't get any dumber. Um, so that's a good thing. But unfortunately, um, it only works really for this case, so it gets worse. Um, so for instance, some examples. Just give you some reaction examples. But look at the reaction, for various reactions, look at the A observed and the A calculated and the activation energy from experiment. We'll look at a classic, a classic reaction, NO plus O, goes to NO2 plus O2. So very important reaction in interstellar, or not interstellar medium, sorry, not O, sorry, O3. Really important atmospheric reaction. Let's look at another one very similar, same products, but a different, or sorry, same reactants, but different products. These can also form NO3 plus O, same reactants. We would assume that since they're the same reactants, they should have the same A, right? Because it's only dependent on their cross-section. So these should have the same A, experimentally, at least from our theory. Um, we'll, look at H, we'll also look at H2, the reaction we just looked at, C2H4 goes to C2H6. Okay, and so if we look at the calculated ones, they're all about the same because all molecules are about the same size. So one's 5.01 times 10 to the 10. 5.01 times 10 to the 10, roughly. This is, and this one is 7, or what I have it, sorry, 4.2. 4.2 times 10 to the 11. And the experimental activation energies for these, these are in kilojoules per mole. 10.5, 29.3, 29.4. And I wrote that this one was 180, or 29.3. Okay, and let's look at the observed. Well, the observed one for this is 7.94 times 10 to the 8. It's two orders of magnitude smaller. But not only that, it's related reactions, same reactants. This one's 6.31 times 10 to the 9. It's 10 times faster, 10 times more collisions per second. Now, the reaction overall is slower because its activation energy is higher. But the collisions occur more frequently. And this one is actually way off. This one is 1.24 times 10 to the 6. <laughs> right, so even for this reaction, hard sphere doesn't really get you that close. And that's the, because 
the, act, the activation energy part is the big part, right? This takes the biggest toll on the rate. And so small, these are comparatively to the exponent, these differences of five orders of magnitude are insignificant compared to e to the minus 85. Right? It's a huge number or a high, tiny, tiny, tiny number. Uh, so so it, it hides the fact, this 20% error hides the fact that we're after, actually off by five orders of magnitude. So hard sphere doesn't actually work that well, but it's the best we can do right now. Um, it's still quite useful, and I'll explain why. Once I remember what my next example is. Because what we've, what, we've, what we've forgotten is that not every orientation of the two molecules leads to a reaction. So let me give you a really great example of something that chemists have studied for a long time and physicists. is the reaction of rubidium atoms in the gas phase with molecules. So we'll look at a really classic example of the reaction of methyl iodide to form rubidium iodide and methyl radical. Okay. Rubidium is often used in the gas phase because it's really easy to get rubidium in a gas phase. It's just a nice atom. It's got one unpaired electron. It's just a really nice pleasant atom to get to use. So you often see a lot of gas phase studies with it. And what they did is they they did they took their methyl their me, or their methyl iodide. So here's our methyl iodide, and they imagine. Let me let me draw an axis. Imagine you draw an axis along the methyl carbon bond, right? And then we attack. We shoot rubidium atoms at it at some degree theta relative to that axis. Right, so the rubidium comes in and collides with the system, and we look at it as a function of the of degrees. Right? We 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 send rubidium at degrees from zero to two pi. Okay, and then we look at the reaction efficiency as a function of degrees. Right? So what is is the reaction efficiency or the rate of formation of rubidium iodide as a function of time as a function of the angle, right? So how fast is there, is there a, I hate this color, I'm just going to use that again. Um, how, how does the rate change as the, inc the incident angle of attack changes, okay? Right, or you can also say that this is the same as the rate constant as a function of theta. Okay, what's the rate constant as a function of theta? That's kind of a, that's not really what they look at, but it's rather, they measure how much rubidium iodide appears as a function of theta. Right? The, they have a mass spec, and they just measure the signal of rubidium iodide as a function of the degrees. And that tells you something about the efficiency. And what they find is this, kind of in a hard sphere way, here's our methyl iodide sphere, here's our rubidium atom touching it. Here's our cross section, our hard sphere cross section. I'm not going to shade it because I, I need to shade in a second. So that's our cross section. And actually, so let me draw this more explicitly um, because it's the geometry is important here. But what you find is that the entire region subtended by this angle no reaction occurs. Right? So it, and that maybe that should make sense, right? Because the rubidium plucks the iodine, so it wants to be on the side of the iodine in order to react, right? So the transition state for this probably looks something like this. You have so um, methyl radical is planar, so it looks planar. I is being broken and forming rubidium, something like that. Right? That's what this transition state probably looks like. 
Right? And so that means if the rubidium comes on the other side, then nothing's going to happen. Right? So what we can do then is say, well, only a fraction of sigma is reactive. So define P, which we call the steric factor. as the ratio of sigma reactive over the entire sigma, right? So basically how many angle, how big is the angle that subtends the cone of cone of shame? And we'll call this the cone of shame. Right? So is it what fraction of two pi is this? So p should run between zero and one. Right? Alright, so what we can do then is replace the rate and add p to it, p a e to the minus e a over r t, where a is equal to sigma times the velocity times the concentrations. Okay, so we add the steric factor. All right, and that should account for the fact that you know some of the trajectories are no good. Okay, so let's look at numerical numbers. Let's look at experiment now. Right? Unfortunately, we, it's not easy to calculate these things, so we have to go into lab and figure them out. Right? Calculating reactions is a very, very hard process. Um, very difficult. So often experiments are a very helpful way to do it. So let's look at H2 plus C2H4, right? our ethylene reaction to form ethane, C2H6. P here for this reaction is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 6, right? There's our extra factor of a million that we missed out over here. That's where it went. It's because only a millionth of the orientations can lead to a reaction. Right? That's what this tells us. And that should make sense when you think about this, what's going on in this reaction. So mechanistically, let's imagine I draw ethylene here in the plane of the board, so the hydrogen stick in and out of the board. So it's bringing out the organic chemistry information. Right, so there's our, there's our ethane sitting like this in the plane of the board. You've got hydrogen, well, sorry, it's in the, in the plane of the board. No, it's an, in, sorry, it's perpendicular to the board, the hydrogen are sticking out and going in, right? And that means that in this molecule you have the pi orbitals of the double bond. These are the pi orbitals of the double bond, double bond orbitals, right? And the hydrogen has to come in and attack these, these things that are in the plane of the board. So the only, so if hydrogen comes in like this, there's nothing to react with. Right? If it comes in like this, nothing to react with. Right? And what it has to do is it has to come in through the plane of the board, like so. And I'll push electrons. Like so. And it has to attack those pi bonds. Right? And then you form right, ethane in some ways. Is ethane is just two hydrogens in and out of the board, and then two in the board. Right, right. They have to add across that way. Right. So, so ethane and, and hydrogen have to come in parallel to each other. Right. The double bond of car ethylene has to come in plane parallel with the double bond, the single bond of hydrogen. Right. So there's really only a very small fraction of possible orientations leading to this very small steric factor. Right? It has, it's very structurally selective of a reaction. Meanwhile, some reactions like these, again, NO is a radical, and O3 is quite a reactive molecule. They don't give two shits about, about what 
order, what collision they want to come into, you know, which orientation they come into, they're going to exchange electrons whether you like it or not, which is why the A's for these are pretty close. I mean, they're not exactly close. They're off by an order of magnitude, but at least they're not off by six orders of magnitude. Right? And you often see that with radicals, things with radicals that they tend to want to, they are very efficient at reacting. Um, and so they, they tend to not have a, a major steric factor. But even the steric factor approximation isn't always good. So here's another classic reaction. If you take potassium ions and react it with bromine in the gas phase, you get KBr, again, these are radicals, plus K. Uh, a experiment, or sorry, A theory, hard sphere, the one we would calculate the hard spheres is 2.1 times 10 to the 11. An experiment is actually bigger. It's 1.0 times 10 to the 12. It's five times larger, which means that P for this reaction is 4.8. So some reactions are even more efficient than you would think, theoretically. This reaction is actually more efficient than geometry would suggest. And the reason why that is, is a limitation of the hard sphere approximation. Because if you draw bromine as a sphere, so here's our bromine ellipsoid. It's not a, a but whatever. Bear with me. And potassium, the way potassium looks like is you have a small sphere of the, of the nucleus and the inner electrons, and then a very large shell with the single electron in potassium. Right? So this is the electron shell. The outer, this is the 2s electron shell. It's very large, and you have a very small diameter in here. That electron sticks out like a sore thumb. This is, a, this is the elephant in the room, if you will. Right? It's an elephant electron in the room. It's massive. And the, the thing is about electrons, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of, the, the, the rate, the, the nuclei rate, the nuclear radius, the inner radius of, of potassium is quite small compared to the radius of the, of the valence electron. And electrons are particularly leaky. So in fact, what happens is, is that when this collides, if you think about it from a, a hard sphere perspective, the electron of the potassium can actually infiltrate the hard sphere of bromine. And right? it can actually get closer than you would expect from hard spheres. Because the, this, this sphere is a ton of empty space. And electrons are small. Actually, they're point-like. They don't have a physical size. It's just a point. Actually, I'm just going to write that as a point-like particle. Right, and it can just infiltrate that hard sphere. Right, so so the bromine hard sphere can keep the nuclei out, can keep the heavy matter out, but it can't keep an electron out. Right, so because it can then get closer than you would expect from hard sphere, your cross section is larger than you would expect. So assuming hard sphere, that means your steric factor is greater than 1. So again, it's not an amazing approximation, but again, we're dealing with orders of magnitude here, right? And if you talk to any kinetics, anybody who does kinetics, I spent a couple years uh, um, working with a lot of people who did kinetics, and they're really happy if they get to an order, if they get an order of like five orders of, like a power of five within the correct answer, they're over the moon about it. Um, so it's not, the, it's not that precise of a, of a system because co collisions are very complicated. I'm much more complicated than, than I say here, because obviously they're not spheres. Not only are they not spheres, but you have to consider molecules, that molecules can rotate, they can vibrate, they have electronic excitations, they have all these different ways they can move, which is the focus of our next semester's class. And so in order to calculate an accurate rate, you have to consider the fact that sometimes molecules will be rotating really fast, they might have vibrations that will absorb energy particularly efficiently, or you might excite an electron or something. So, so studying collisions from a theoretical perspective is pretty tough. 
So I will say that at the very least, just by assuming spherical cows, we do okay. Right? We do okay. In some ways, they still kind of look like spheres, but they're very picky spheres that have very selective geometries for, for reactions sometimes. So it's not an amazing theory, but at least gets us to the right place qualitatively. We could spend an entire year talking about modeling these more accurately. I talk about the influence of vibration, rotation, electronics, um, and translation, and how they all couple to each other. I spent an entire class, there's entire textbooks on it. And even when you include those factors, you can still only get to a factor of two. It's even more complicated than that in real life. So it's a tough problem. But the, the essence of the physics is right here with just spheres, right? Just collisions. Just collisions. Okay. So um, that's all I got for you today. Uh, next class, um, we'll come back to this. We'll, we'll come back to we'll come back to kinetics. We'll talk about rate laws. Um, and I want to teach. We're going to learn a lesson you never learn in organic chemistry, which is that a bimolecular reaction is actually a three-body reaction, and a unimolecular reaction is actually a two-body reaction. So we'll have to explain why that is. Um, it's a really beautiful story, and I look forward to telling you guys about it. Anyway, have a nice weekend. Yeah. I'll see some of you tomorrow. Take it easy.